right now we're going to have our lunch session with Tobias Adrian from the Financial Counselor and Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the International Monetary Fund. Hello, um, it's my pleasure to be with you virtually and I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, what I'm going to do today uh, is to present an outline over global financial stability. Um, and uh, I'm going to cover a wide range of, of, of issues that are relevant today. So here is uh, the general outline. Um, in our view, policymakers are facing a complicated trade-off as um, geopolitics have become very uncertain. The repercussions of the war in Ukraine will test the resilience of the financial system. Financial stability risks have risen and the balance of risk to growth has tilted to the downside. The commodity shock complicates the monetary policy normalization process. Greater differentiation across emerging markets and developing economies put further pressures on portfolio flows. As unresolved pandemic related challenges persist, high financing needs are uh, present and limited fiscal space remains. The conflicts bring several medium term structural issues to the fore, such as energy security, market functioning, particularly in commodity markets. It's crucial to intensify efforts towards the climate transition while addressing energy security concerns. Let's start uh, with taking a close look at global financial conditions. Um, so the left chart shows you financial conditions broken down uh, into the US, the Euro area, Latin America, Central, Eastern and Southern Europe and the Middle East and Africa. So the further north you are, the tighter the financial conditions are. So you can think of that as something like a credit spread. So you can see in particular that in Central, Eastern and Southern Europe, financial conditions have tightened significantly. Um, in all other regions, they have tightened as well, but they remain somewhat easy by historical standards in the US. Uh, they're close to neutral in the Euro area in Latin America, and they're very tight uh, in the Middle East, Africa and Central, Eastern and, and Southern Europe. Um, in a lot of work we have done uh, in recent years, we have linked downside risks to growth to financial conditions. And you can see that indeed the tightening of financial conditions corresponds to an increase in the downside risk to global growth. So what we're plotting here is the fifth percentile as of um, 2022Q1 compared with 2021Q3. And so the distribution has shifted to the left and the skewness has increased. We also plot the unconditional density and you can see that the tilt is, is decidedly to the left. So by historical standards on the, on the right side, uh, you can see that the fifth percentile uh, is uh, in the lower rank. Um, so this is plotting the historical distribution of the fifth percentile. So uh, this is you know, how between around uh, the 30th percentile of the distribution of the fifth percentile. So we are by historical standards in a region with quite a lot of downside risk. Downside risk is only higher in events such as the 2008 crisis or the COVID event. Now let's take a look at the impact of the Russian war in Ukraine on financial assets. Equity sold off in the immediate aftermath, particularly in sectors affected by commodity prices and supply chain uh, disruptions. Um, and so you can see here um, January through late February in red and the war period, uh, which is uh, starting February 23rd in blue. Um, so, um, you know, some of the sell offs are directly linked uh, to the war, such as the sell off in financials uh, or uh, the sell off in emerging markets. Um, but, you know, other sectors have actually gained since the war. 
uh, for example, the energy sector and, of course, food and healthcare. Uh, overall, though, the aggregate picture is that there has been a sell-off since the beginning of the year, and of course, much of that is related not just to the war, but also to the tightening of monetary policy. Now, turning to the right, credit spreads have widened in most of low-rated corporates, right? So these are the credit spreads uh, first broken down by sectors, uh, and that is... Uh, um, uh, the level of uh, the credit spreads pre-pandemic and currently. And you can see that uh, right now credit spreads are significantly higher than pre-pandemic. And that's particularly so for lower rated credit shown in the lower chart. Now, the Russian war has had a significant impact on commodity prices. The left chart shows you that several commodity prices rose dramatically on fears of supply disruptions. Um, this is particularly so for European natural gas, uh, but also for coal, uh, and to some degree for palladium, wheat, crude, and nickel. The middle chart shows you that uh, volatility in commodity markets has been at historically low, high levels. Um, so. The chart in the middle shows the, the weekly percent change of a commodity index, and that is higher uh, in uh, early uh, February uh, than even in the 70s. Now, turning to nickel, uh, there was, of course, the disruption in the London Metals Exchange. Um, you can see that uh, generally um, uh, commodity producers, uh, so these are here denoted by commercials, those have short positions to hedge the exposure in the underlying. And some of those short positions are speculative. So uh, reportedly, there was one firm that had a very large short position. And then, of course, in late February and early March, prices rose significantly. So there were margin calls, and the firm was very close to distress. Uh, margin calls uh, were uh, increasing, and that uh, led to a shutdown of the London Metals Exchange market for nickel. Uh, so that was uh, one market functioning issues, but more generally, uh, commodity markets have withstood the very, very sharp price increases relatively well. Some short-lived tensions on funding and liquidity conditions are certainly present. So for example, in the US money market, uh, conditions have tightened uh, while uh, the commercial paper market has functioned fairly well. You can see um, some of those money market spreads, and those have widened, but by far less than in, uh, in uh, February and March 2020. The middle chart shows you the cross-currency basis, which is a, a metric of international dollar funding conditions. Um, you know, this uh, basis has become more negative, i.e. there's more funding stress, but overall, it's not that unusual by historical standards. Another metric is uh, illiquidity in, um, in uh, the treasury market. So these are root mean squared arrows of the fitted US treasury yield curve. So the bigger these fitting arrows are, the more illiquid the market tends to be. And you can see that uh, at least by the metric of JP Morgan, uh, illiquidity has become uh, quite severe after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Turning to inflation pressures, uh, those have continued to build. So the left-hand chart shows you the year-to-date uh, changes in advanced economy yields. Clearly, nominal yields have increased, mainly uh, driven uh, by uh, break-evens that are higher. But real yields are also higher in, in many parts of the world, except for Japan, of course. Uh, the middle chart shows, you in particular, the breakdown uh, at the five-year horizon and the five to ten-year forward horizon for the euro area uh, and the U.S. And you can see that, you know, um, the five-year, five-year forwards remain in, in relatively contained territory. So, uh, uh, observers generally uh, feel that um, inflation expectations are uh, contained to date. Uh, but of course, at the five year horizon, you see a very sharp uprise in, in breaking inflation uh, well above targets. 
you also see this very sharp rise of inflation expectations for Latin America and Central uh, Eastern uh, Europe, uh, shown in red and, and, and blue, uh, where inflation is well above target. So this is deviation from target inflation shown on the right. Um, of course, Asia, emerging market Asia is somewhat different. The inflation remains low. But what is very interesting in this chart is that there's an expectation that inflation is going to come down towards the end of 2022. And that, of course, takes into account that monetary policy is, is, is being tightened significantly and will continue to be tightened in order to achieve that outcome. Now, to achieve the outcome of returning inflation back to target, uh, you can see that around the world, the implied path, so the market implied path for monetary policy has tightened significantly uh, when you compare now to pre-invasion and to the end of 2021. So, for example, uh, in the case of the US shown on the left, this uh, delta is, is over 200 basis points, close to 250 basis points, depending on where you look at the implied path. Uh, for the euro area, you also have a tightening of nearly 200 basis points. Um, and Latin America, uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, and Emerging Market Asia, the magnitudes are even larger, around 200 to 250 basis points for Latin America and uh, Central Eastern Europe. Of course, Emerging Market Asia has less of that, but there's also a shift by about 100 basis points. So uh, markets expect monetary policy to tighten significantly around the world, uh, really everywhere you look. Now, um, of course, central banks are trying to manage a soft landing. Um, and um, what you should see on the left chart is that there's a potential risk for repricing as the effects of quantitative tightening on the path of rates remains uncertain. So our term premium models expect uh, that um, a, a sharp unwinding of quantitative tightening could lead to a 50 to 60 basis point additional increase in the term premium. So the risk premium embedded in 10 year real yields. Um, and so, you know, on top of these 150 or 200 basis point increases, uh, those are adding up to very large numbers. Now, having said that, the slope of the yield curve is one of the best forecasters of recession. You can see that whenever the 10 year three month spread has inverted, which is shown in purple on the right chart, this has forecast a recession historically. And at the moment, there's no such inversion. Having said that, many observers do uh, expect a recession, at least a mild recession in some countries around the world. Climate change uh, continues to be the number one challenge uh, for the world. And at the moment, uh, there's a lot of debate of the trade-off between energy security and energy transition. Europe's reliance on Russia for key commodities is leading to decisive trade-offs in energy policy. You can see here the share of Russia in respect of import volumes in the European Union, and that is particularly high for coal and ga gas and, and also palladium. Uh, performance of renewable energy indices has deteriorated amidst energy security concerns. You can see that the relative performance of clean energy ETFs versus thermal coal and oil and gas indices has deteriorated sharply. Finally, renewable energy generation capacity should more than double by 2026 in order to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And of course, we are way behind those targets as a recent IPCC report uh, is making uh, clear. When you look across emerging markets, you see a huge amount of differentiation. Commodity imports have been hit hardest. Um, so uh, what is perhaps most striking is that the number of countries, so those are countries with market access. So these are either emerging markets or frontier markets that, that have market access. And uh, when you count the numbers of countries that have sovereign um, spreads above 1,000 basis points, that is at 17 right now. 
and that is higher than in 2020 or 2008. So the number of countries in distress is a very large number at the moment. The middle chart shows you that commodity in importers have seen the sharpest increase in spreads. So this shows you the BB minus or lower rated importers where spreads have increased uh, by over 250 basis points. And commodity exporters, or for example, the GCC countries, you know, have seen pretty much no change in the spread. Turning to equities and commodities, uh, you can see that you know, China has been hit particularly hard, but this is for reasons other than the war. This is because China is slowing down at the moment. Commodity importers have been uh, hit hard and uh, commodities exporters did fairly well in the immediate aftermath of the war, but recently has, have also seen a reversal. Finally, portfolio flow pressures have intensified. Portfolio flows recovered in early 2022, but have become highly volatile recently. There was a sharp sell-off following the war, but most recently there's a reversal. When we're looking at the capital flows at risk, so the forecast density of capital flows for the emer entire emerging market universe, you can see that that distribution has shifted to the left with much more uh, downside risks to capital flows. Looking at uh, the banks in emerging markets, emerging market sovereigns are more reliant on bank funding. And that's in the context where public debt, debt has surged in emerging markets. Bank holdings of sovereign debt have surged and uh, the reliance on bank financing can amplify sovereign risks. Foreign bank and corporate exposures to Russia and Ukraine are contained. The direct exposures to Russia are modest and aggregate. There are indirect exposures that may be more significant, but from what we can see, even those are, are, are fairly contained. So here we're showing you, for example, the FX swaps and outright forwards. And uh, when we look at European cor corporates uh, and corporates around the world uh, with exposure to Russia, even those uh, they're, they're concentrated in, in Europe, uh, but, you know, uh, they are fairly uh, manageable. Finally, uh, let's talk about uh, crypto assets. Uh, of course, we have seen a spectacular uh, collapse of some of the stable coins, but I want to focus on here is uh, the usage of uh, stable coin uh, for potentially for undermining uh, capital flow measures. So you can see on the left chart that Tether trading against the merge market of X has been on the rise, but it's mostly concentrated in the Turkish Lira, uh, of course, a country that has significant challenges at the moment. So uh, this could be an indication of uh, capital flows through crypto assets. Now, when we look at uh, the premium um, of uh, buying crypto, uh, in Russia or in Ukraine. In Ukraine, there's a very large premium uh, for buying, say, Bitcoin uh, of the order of 10 or 11%. In Russia, there was at first a discount. So if anything, not an outflow of Bitcoin, but an inflow of Bitcoin. But most recently, that has reverted and there's now also a sign of a shortage uh, in terms of the premium to buy crypto within Russia as opposed to externally. Finally, uh, the rapid growth of fintech with less regulation can be a financial stability risk. We're focusing particularly on decentralized finance assets, and you can see here that those are growing extremely rapidly. Financial vulnerabilities are, are rising in China's property sector. Leverage concerns and liquidity shocks from tighter escrow requirements are uh, particularly concerning. You can see that there's a close to a 25% uh, shortage of liquidity uh, in these real estate firms, and that uh, most of the liabilities at risk are owed to banks or home buyers. Uh, so this is a confluence of a slowdown of economic growth and a very sharp slowdown of the property sector in China. The two things are interacting and they are putting uh, financial stability at risk. Finally, let me briefly go through the policy recommendations. 
ending the war and bringing back peace is the first priority. In addition, inflationary pressures have to become have to be prevented from becoming entrenched. Uh, the trade-off uh, between fighting persistent inflation and safeguarding the recovery has to be managed. There has to be a decisive action to avoid unmooring of inflation expectations and bring inflation back to target. It is extremely important to remain data dependent, watch key variables, and communication is essential to ensure orderly market reaction. Second, manage spending pressures under reduced fiscal space. Where health concerns permit, continue to ease out of broad pandemic support towards policy normalization. In view of high energy and food prices, use targeted and temporary transfers or lump sum utility bill discounts. If appropriate, allow gradual pass throughs, tax breaks, and uh, sunset uh, clauses. Commit to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies and increase carbon pricing gradually to deliver Paris commitments. Third, multilateral cooperation and investment into the futures are key. Let me stop here. Thank you uh, for your interest. And let's go to the discussion. First of all, thank you very much. It was a very enlightening presentation and it gave a very good picture of what's going on right now, especially after the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine war started. Uh, my questions go into different directions and I'll try to be very brief on them. The first one is regarding the degree of liquidity uh, of, of the markets right now, because with this tightening of monetary policy, uh, the degree of liquidity in dollars will be strongly reduced. And if that can generate threats in terms of fragmentation of the, of, of the payment systems, in the sense that you can offer alternatives that do not rely only on the dollar as the main payment system, especially considering what I've been reading about, because after the, the international reserves of Russia was, was, were frozen during the beginning of the war, other countries are becoming particularly worried to maintain their, their reserves in, in US dollars in, in, the, in the US right now. So if that could be a threat on this. The second question, I was, I was the three, and sorry, if you, if you want to uh, answer one of them specifically, I'll be, uh, we have to stop and then continue. But the second one is regarding uh, energy transition and energy security that you mentioned about this short-term trade-off between those. My question goes in the relationship, in the, in the interaction between those two elements in the sense that in a medium term, if actually the energy transition is the only solution for energy security. So considering what we have now with Russia, if that actually wouldn't be a push towards moving towards R&D investments and physical investments towards energy transition that can actually solve this emergent problem that we are having right now. If you're opt uh, my question is if you're actually optimistic <laughs> about that uh, or not. And finally, uh, my question is about the role of crypto because we, we've seen this very volatile behavior of, of, of crypto value of uh, Bitcoin and other, the other cryptos. Um, in the beginning of the year with, with, with the crisis in, in Kazakhstan and then right now in Kyrgyzstan, sorry, uh, and then right now with the, with, with the war in, um, in Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, if you see that now uh, countries are starting to regulate crypto, if, do you see if crypto can still become like this alternative for, for um, portfolio allocation of, of resources that it has been last year? So um, I ask these, these three questions, sorry it was too long, but, but I open them to, to, to the debate and after that we can open for a round of, of discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. These are, these are very good uh, questions. So let me take each one in turn. Uh, the first one is on market liquidity. Uh, we do see that uh, market liquidity in treasury markets is strained but it's not disorderly at the moment. So markets are very one-sided. You know, there's a sell-off. We have seen a sell-off for the past four weeks in global markets, in equity markets, in treasury markets, and to some degree in corporate bond markets and, and uh, lower rated uh, uh, countries as well. Uh, but it hasn't been disorderly. So yes, there's illiquidity, but it's not disorderly. So we, we don't have the kind of dash for cash phenomenon that we saw back in 2020. Um, having said that, and I think you alluded to that in the question, you know, central banks have to tighten at the moment. So if there was a disorderly 
uh, episode. So if there was again a dash for cash and the, you know just so sort of like everybody's selling everything, the bar for central banks to come in with backstops uh, that would include increased asset purchases, that bar is very high. And so, um, you know, you always sort of like have in the back of your mind that there's some sort of central bank put somewhere. But I think at the moment that put is very far uh, uh, out of the money. Um, so we could well see an acceleration of sell-offs and, and more illiquidity for some time. I mean, at some points, the central banks would have to come in, but I think uh, that would be that would be quite far out in the tail. So I, I, I would not be surprised if there was you know, some, some disorderly uh, selling uh, at some point. Your second question is about energy transition. So of course, what we've seen is a very sharp increase in, in commodity prices and oil prices, natural gas prices, particularly in Europe, but also metals prices, uh, including all the metals that are used for computers and cars. Um, and um, so uh, many countries, in particular in continental Europe, uh, realize that they have to think about um, commodity uh, supply, not just in terms of price, but also in terms of where it comes from and what it means for, for security and energy security. So, um, you know, there is this concern that taxes are going to be lowered uh, as opposed to be raised, at least in the short term. I think from a kind of uh, global optimal behavior, you would like to see that commodity prices would stay at this high level by increasing tax rates once oil prices are coming down or once other carbon, you know, coal prices are coming down, you would like to see an increase. And I think this is what you alluded to in your question, right? Isn't this an opportunity, given that we already see the high prices, couldn't we somehow calibrate the taxes in a way that we're going to keep these prices at this level and so you know basically use this uh, uh, adverse shock as an opportunity to transition into a higher carbon price uh, uh, regime and i think in principle from an economic point of view that is very uh, very um, uh, welcome but of course the politics of that are, are very very tricky um, um you know carbon uh, pricing hits uh, the poorer population disproportionately uh, uh, in a disproportionate manner, right? Because um, for, for, for many uh, lower income households, uh, driving to work for long distances is a, is a, is a key component uh, to, go, to get to work. And um, so you have to have some compensa compensatory uh, tax and, and subsidy mechanism if you want to do that. And figuring out the details of that is, is quite difficult. Now, the third uh, question is about crypto regulation. So if cryptos were to be regulated, what would that mean, right? <laughs> because of course, Bitcoin per se is just an algorithm. It cannot be regulated, right? Bitcoin in and of itself cannot be regulated. What can be regulated is the access point to Bitcoin. The vast majority of users are using uh, uh, companies like uh, you know, Coinbase, uh, FTX, um, or Binance in order to get into the crypto world. And so those are kind of like infrastructures at this point. And these infrastructures could be regulated for um, operational risk, for prudential purposes, for consumer and investor protection. So I think what you would see is not that Bitcoin per se would be regulated, but rather that the entry points where you know, there are hundreds of millions of users are using these you know, essentially five or six firms globally. And those firms could be regulated similar to market infrastructures. So it would not necessarily change the way in which uh, you know, say cryptocurrencies would be used, but it would uh, make the access points more resilient and it would enhance investor protection and consumer protection. Hello, hello, thank you. My name is uh, Russell Napier. One of the things I do is I try to forecast the future economics and finance. I speak to a lot of people who do the same thing. And basically, we're all trying to work out what you're going to do. Uh, and I, I don't mean the IMF per se, but policymakers in general. Uh, based on your presentation, you spend a lot of time looking at what we're doing. 
uh, because you're looking at market prices. Now, are you a little bit concerned about this? That uh, you know we are always trying to reflect your actions in prices, and then you're basing policy off these very same prices that we're really ultimately these days spending more time pricing you. And just to make it then very specific, the five-year, five-year in particular seems for some policymakers to be very important. Uh, and are you not somewhat concerned about hanging so much upon that particular market uh, indicator, which once again has a feedback loop into our expected policy actions that you're going to make? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned. <laughs> I'm very worried about the current juncture. Uh, and I think what you're pointing to is exactly the, 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 the crux of the problem, right? Um, so we are in, in an environment with very high inflation. We might have, uh, uh, we might see a kind of turning point in terms of the level of inflation. So the debate at the moment is whether inflation is just temporarily high and it's going to come down naturally, or whether inflation in and of itself is going to stay high, in which case there has to be a break in the kind of monetary policy regime. Um, so I worry about expectations formation. So I worry that, um, you know, inflation expectations are going to drift up and stay elevated. And that would then necessitate much more aggressive monetary policy actions. Uh, so exactly this feedback in between monetary policy actions and expectations formation, as well as price formation, is extremely worrisome at the, at, at the current juncture. There's a lot of uncertainty when I talk to you know, central bankers. Uh, they face a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, so you know, most central banks want to tighten enough to slow economic activity without generating a recession. And that is, of course, uh, very difficult to do, right? When you look at the history, uh, it is very hard to find countries where inflation was as elevated as it is today in, in most of the advanced economies. UK is, is about eight or nine percent, US is eight or nine percent, continental Europe, seven or eight percent, depending on which country and what metrics you're looking at. These are very high levels and generating a slowdown in activity without a recession is extremely difficult. But that is the objective of uh, policymakers at the moment. And yes, uh, expectations formation is absolutely crucial in that. And uh, I worry a lot about this feedback loop in between the policymakers and the markets. So what we're always telling central banks is communicate what you are going to do and how it is state contingent. So how things would be changing if, uh, say, inflation turns out to be more, more, more persistent. Uh, but of course, these are all very, very difficult things to do. Just following up on the food feedback loop point you're making, uh, which you made um, uh, between markets and policymakers, what about the additional, I guess, node in the feedback loop with the with politics and with uh, people in the real economy and how that actually plays out? Do you want to just say something about that and maybe the IMF's considerations in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, politics are uh, at a crucial point. Uh, we worry about fragmentation uh, globally, uh, fragmentation into East and West, um, where, you know, multilateral uh, cooperation, as has been the case since uh, the Second World War, might break down more and more as we're seeing this uh, fragmentation. So that is a, a first order a concern. It's all about geopolitics and about how uh, countries like China uh, are going to uh, evolve going forward in terms of politics. Now, this is interacting also with the economic situation in China, right? Because, um, of course, uh, uh, China is slowing down. Uh, the property market is uh, collapsing. And, um, you know, that in turn is going to feed back into what uh, uh, politicians are going to do. Uh, in China. So how, say, the U.S. versus China and Europe versus uh, the U.S. and versus China is going to evolve is at a, at a very crucial juncture at the moment. And uh, I agree with you that the, the interaction between economics, politics, and, uh, and, and geopolitics has become very difficult and, and, and uh, very complex. Um, you know, we have elections coming up in the U.S. Uh, in, in about two years, and that could totally change the geopolitics again. So, um, you know, thinking about any, any kind of uh, fixed point or anything like that is, is very, very difficult at the current juncture. We'll have uh, two speakers, and after that, we will have uh, the questions. And the first speaker is going to be uh, Professor Vivian Brown. And... <clears throat> 
she's going to uh, give a talk about the market's mind, a little bit about intersubjective collectives. And uh, she's an emeritus a professor in philosophy and intellectual uh, history in the Open University. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much to Patrick for inviting me to this symposium. I have to say that it was when Patrick invited me that I first heard of cognitive economics. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to come to this symposium was that I was very interested to hear about cognitive economics, particularly as I wondered whether there might be some relation with my recent work, um, which looks at... Um, oh, here, I have to take a pause. I, I look at some aspects of... Um, what it means to talk about shared beliefs and shared knowledge amongst individual agents in social context. And that also links up with understanding issues in game theory and other, if you like, social problems or social issues. I should add to that very kind introduction that um, I started off as an economist. So I have a sort of economist background and I'm sure that analytic philosophers don't regard me as a proper philosopher. <laughs> I've also spent some time doing intellectual history. And here, of course, I should mention Adam Smith. I spent quite a lot of time working on Adam Smith. And I have to say that the roots of my interest in intersubjectivity come from Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. But I wouldn't in any way suggest that um, the theories that I've been putting forward and the arguments that I'm going to propose to you this afternoon could in any way be interpreted as Smithian. Um, so uh, I thought I should just clarify that. Um, okay, so maybe we should, maybe I should just start. Now this little, so I have to turn around to see what's on the screen. I don't have something here to, so I'm sorry, I have to keep turning, turning my head away from the audience in order to check that the right... As I was completely new to cognitive economics, I've really taken my understanding uh, of what it is of cognitive economics from Patrick's paper, the 2022 paper, the primer that he circulated to us and also the, um, the shorter version of it that appears in um, Economic Affairs. So to a certain extent, the first part of the paper is an engagement with the arguments that Patrick puts forward rather than any, an engagement with the field of people working in the area of cognitive economics or, or um, the market mind hypothesis. Um, so um, Patrick posits the two-way premise of market as mind and mind as market. In this talk, I focus really on the market as mind component. I mean, maybe that's a problem in that if I understood better what the mind as market component was about, my comments on the market as mind components would be better informed. But this is the way it is. Now, as I understand it, the central claim of this component of the market mind hypothesis is that the market mind is a collective mind with market mood its phenomenal experience. And I hope that's an uncontentious summary of the, the core notion of the market mind hypothesis. Now, what I want to argue is that this central claim is presented in two quite different modes. One mode is that there is a mind, the market mind, or the market as mind, is the mind of a singular collective entity. This comes in various forms of manifestations, but it's quite clear that it's a, sing, a singular collective entity. The second mode, I argue, is in terms of the intersubjective relations of market investors. Now, it strikes me that these two modes are very, very different. And I find the distinction very interesting, particularly the second mode. And what I would like to do is to present an interpretation of the second mode, the intersubjective relations, um, in terms of some of the work that I've been doing that I mentioned a few moments ago, for example, in relation to game theory. Um, now, this interpretation of the second mode leads me to question the standard individual collective dichotomy, which I think is standard right across the disciplines, across philosophy, across um, all the social sciences, and I've been hearing it today. 
and um, I've come across it in some of the readings I've done, and I certainly think it's very present in, um, in Patrick's paper as well. Um, I then provide an example of how different economic implications might well follow from the intersubjective approach. And here, I suppose, I, re I relate to the issue of, well, even if the market can be thought of as a mind, what difference would that make to how we analyse economic relations of the market? And what I do here is to offer a summary of the kind of approach I've taken in relation to game theory, where I argue that we get very, very different results if we analyse it in terms of intersubjective relations between players as opposed to individual relations between players. And in that particular case, I also argue that the intersubjective approach provides a very simple and intuitive explanation of some of the difficulties that game theory has, has encountered. These difficulties are well, are well recognised in the literature, for example. So, say, for example, the equilibrium selection problem. Okay, and then at the end of that, I just pose the possibility of some implications for the market mind hypothesis. Okay, so the first question that struck me as I was reading the paper is just how we interpret market as mind. And again, I note a number of these issues did come up this morning. And I'm not sure that there is a settled view amongst the proponents of the market mind hypothesis or whether really they speak to different variations of the hypothesis, depending on people's interests, depending on the kind of modelling that they want to do. But I just mentioned three here. The first, um, it's a striking metaphor, and perhaps this view it was only a striking metaphor. On the other hand, a metaphor with its sort of freshness can suggest new lines of research. It can be productive in terms of, sort of analytical potential, but by itself, it, it doesn't do that on its own. It has to be, it's a starting point of an analysis. Um, the second, market is to be theorised as if a mind. Um, I, I go on to accept that this is possibly the main variant, really, that is relevant. But finally, the market is a mind in some sense. Now, I'm not making this up. Uh, I've got to pull it out. Um, my sense was that the primer was a little more generous towards the market is a mind than the, the published version in um, Economic Affairs. But even so, I've just pulled out here a quotation from the symposium website, which says, what if the market, instead of simply aggregating individual minds, creates and gathers into existence a collective mind of its own, including extended consciousness. Now, I raise the question, is this simply a provocative entree to the subject? Um, or is it more than this? Is there some residual sense that there, is, that there are ontological issues at stake, in other words, that the one is, in some sense, the same as the other, or is, is the other, or the version of the other? This also leads me to question whether is there a tendency to anthropomorphise market as mind? We have Mr. Market. I couldn't, take, I couldn't help wondering whether this would, would, might, be, might result in different ways of thinking if it were called Lady Market or Mrs. Market. These terms are not neutral. Um, moods and sentiment. We've had a lot of discussion of moods um, this morning. Um, consciousness. Also, intention. Purpose and intention. And the quotation here, intention. The market's intention is to allocate society's material and mental resources as efficiently as possible. Now, what does this mean? Do we really think that the market has intentions? Are they benign intentions? And do we think the market's intention is to allocate society's material and mental resources as efficiently as possible? Um, and it might be contentious as to whether or not that's what the market ever does. But it's a step further to say that that is the market's intention. So it seems to me that the 
anthropomorphizing of the market mm. is having is leaving its traces in certain aspects of the discussion. And I don't know whether this is intentional, whether it's welcome, or whether th th these remarks are, fe are seen as just a sort of, a little bit of flowery language here and there, just to sort of make the whole issue seem a bit more user-friendly. But, you know, we don't really need to attach any significance to such remarks. Um, I would suggest that remarks such as these do have effects. The language that we use really does have effects. And somebody made the... Um, the comment this morning about Deirdre McCloskey's work, and I think the language that we use, um, uh, we need to be mindful of the language that we use because it does have effects in all sorts of ways, perhaps unexpected. Um, so to summarise this, I would say that although very often in the paper it suggests that we should not interpret mind as simply what goes on inside a human being's head, but it's something else, it's, it's an extended mind or some other thing. Um, I wonder if actually this is, is really what's happening, that there is this residual sense of somehow minds have a special relationship with what goes on inside human heads. Um, now, in this talk, I largely work with the second interpretation. If you remember, it's the... Um, the middle one, which I take it is the least, in, least contentious interpretation of the various possibilities. So I largely work with the, the second interpretation that market is to be theorised as if a mind, or maybe in the sense of as, well, as if a mind, in the sense of exploring possible similarities or possi parallels between markets and minds, given that the latter are interpreted as cognitive systems, not as something inside the heads of human beings. Right, that's the interpretation that I'm working with. But then it leads me to wonder, why call it a market mind? If the notion of a mind is carrying such little weight, or meant to be carrying such little weight, why aren't they markets as cognitive systems? Would that be less misleading for people coming to the field? What would be lost if they were called markets as cognitive systems? Um, so that brings me to the notion of metaphors. And I was just going to mention one... One thought about metaphors, um, one of the most famous metaphors to do with the market is, of course, Adam Smith's metaphor of the invisible hand of the market. And, of course, he is here overseeing our discussions. But I have to say that the next slide and the, um, the relevant paragraph in my talk, the, the text of the talk, is completely misleading, and it's mangled. That The point that I was trying to make was utterly mangled. What I was saying, I was talking about Adam Smith's invisible hand metaphor of the market, that the context was the invisible hand of the market. And then I said, Adam Smith's invisible hand, there is no invisible hand in the wealth of nations. What I should have said, Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market does not appear in the wealth of nations. Now, that depends on what you mean by appear. You might say, well, the thought is kind of all over the place. It's on every page. I was referring to the expression invisible hand. Now, there is one use of the expression invisible hand in the wealth of nations, but that comes in book four, in a very long disquisition on the disadvantages of the mercantile system. If you want to look it up, it's, uh, what is it? Chapter 4, sorry, Book 4, Chapter 2 in Paragraph 9. The context for that mention of the invisible hand is, in my view, unrelated to the issue of how markets work to allocate resources or to organise resources. It's a response to... Um, it, it partly draws on um, an analysis presented in Book 3, sorry, Book 2 of The Wealth of Nations, where Smith looks at the natural order of development of investment and he looks at this in terms of like a logical order and in terms of historical order. A part of his complaint against the mercantile system was that it distorted the natural or logical order um, so that history had been disrupted, distorted. Um, and it also refers back to an argument in the, in the first book on the, on the equivalence of exchange value and revenue. 
So there was an attempt to draw on an economic analysis. This mention of the invisible hand isn't just a rhetorical flourish, but I would argue it's got nothing to do what, with what is now understood as the invisible hand of the market. And if Smith had wanted to make that point, he would have made it in book one of The Wealth of Nations, where he did look at prices and, and markets in some of those early chapters. But he doesn't, he doesn't use the expression, and I don't think he either, and he doesn't make the argument. Right. So I'm also kind of offering a little bit of a caution. Um, you know, it's very tempting to refer back to older texts, looking for the anticipations of the modern truths that we, revere, we, that we revere now. But that's a very ahistorical way of reading texts, and it can be very, very distorting. And what I would suggest is that Adam Smith is actually much more interesting if he's read in his own context, not just as somebody who anticipated the, the gems of wisdom that we take for granted now. Okay. Right, the central claim, to return now to the central claim of the market mind, I don't need this when I'm standing here. The market mind, the central claim is market mind hypothesis is market as a collective mind. So what we're going to unpick is the notion of a collective mind. So the market mind is a collective mind with market moods. Well, don't need to hold this even when I'm standing near this mic. That's better, is it? Okay. I'm sorry about that. Right, the market mind is a collective mind with market mood, it's phenomenal experience. Now what I want to argue is that there are two different modes of presentation of this collective mind. The first is the market mind is presented as the mind of a singular collective entity. It's three different versions here, there might be others, but I thought these are the three main versions that were worth picking out. The market as a system of distributed cognition or knowledge, such that the market knows more than any individual trader knows. The second is the collective mind of the market is akin to the mind of a group, where the group is a singular abstract object distinct from its members, or it might, it might, it might not be a yeah, singular object distinct from its individual members. Or well, the third one, the market mind is a composite, or perhaps an aggregate, of individual extended minds. Here there might be group consciousness by individual members. Now, the second mode of presentation of the collective mind is that it's presented in terms of intersubjective relations among the mar market participants. The phenomenal qualitative sensations of market mood are intersubjectively experienced by market <coughs> participants. Um, how it feels to be in it, the mood of the market, is felt intersubjectively among traders. Intersubjective awareness among traders and also consciousness is experienced by investors. So market consciousness is experienced intersubjectively among, among um, investors. Now, I want to point to two, two aspects of this that I think are really very interesting. One is that the notion of the intersubjective relations, I think that it erodes. We've just had that one, haven't we? Right, so the first one, the first issue that I think is very interesting is I think that the emphasis on intersubjective relations erodes the, the, the dichotomy between individual and collective that is widespread across the disciplines. Because what it's suggesting is that really there's a trichotomy, individual, intersubjective and collective. And as an example of an intersubjective approach introduced into game theory, um, um, where players' shared cognizance of the game is construed in terms of the shared standpoint of each of us, um, as I said this, this approach was, if you like, it has a distant, 
origin in, in reading Anna Smith's theory of moral sentiments, but I would say it's entirely detached from Smith now, and he doesn't use this expression of, of each of us, and he doesn't use it at all in economic analysis. Now, players are individuals, but they include themselves among us, the players of the same game. So you might think of the trichotomy in terms of I, each of us, and collective we. And in this case, each of us might be interpreted as a kind of distributive we. So we're using we in its plural sense, but we're not using it collectively. And I think that sense tends to get lost in terms of the straight individual collective dichotomy. Now, I think the interesting question is whether focusing on these intersubjective relations makes possible a different kind of analysis or economic analysis from what is, is available within either an individual or a collective approach. And this was what motivated me to get into this. The starting point for me was if dissatisfaction with the prison's dilemma game. Some of you may know this game. It's a simple game in game theory. Um, it's perhaps the most controversial game um, ever invented. And the point of the game is that um, the payoffs are such that rational players um, end up, rational players individually end up worse than if, by not cooperating than if they had both cooperated. So although it's a simple game, it's been hugely significant in terms of social debate about the role of um, cooperation and the possibilities for cooperation in ordinary social relations. Um, now, my, my interest in this was that it seemed to me that if game theory was really about rational play, it seems very weird that it ends up rec recommending to players a course of action that makes them both worse off. Um, now, other people have tried to solve this in various ways, but to my knowledge, no one has solved it without changing the game in some way, changing the payoffs of the game, or introducing team reasoning which might explain particular situations, but it changes the game. So it doesn't resolve the theoretical problem posed by the game. Now, in standard, standard game theory, um, best supply reasoning is, um, is well, I think it, it's just standard. It's, it's, it's not questioned. Now, th um, if we, if we think of it in terms of, say, a two-by-two two game, two players and two actions, for the individual player, um, best apply reasoning takes the form, I choose my best action given the action that you choose. This is a form of unilateral reasoning, um, and the application of that does lead to problems in a number of games. For example, in The Prisoner's Dilemma, it leads both of the players um, to defect, i.e. not to cooperate, and they both end up worse off. But it seems to me that if one interprets best reply reasoning from the standpoint of each of us, something else happens. If we say that each of us chooses our best action, given the action that each of us chooses, that no longer makes sense. Because what you're no longer doing is separating the subject player from the other player or the other players. What we're doing now is that each of us, each of us chooses our best action given the action that each of us chooses. But we can't choose our best action given the action that each of us chooses because, if you like, that's to assume the outcome of the reasoning before you actually engage in the reasoning. So it's, it's, it's logically, it doesn't make sense. It's not just an issue of logic, it's a question of the ordinary language. Now, the reason for this is that each player includes herself among us, us as a plurality, and this breaks with the strict individualism required for best reply reasoning. So the shared standpoint of each of us thus potentially transforms the logic of individual choice in game theory. OK. Um, Okay, beyond the individual collective dichotomy for market mind hypothesis. Now, the general point I'm making here 
is that the individual collect is that the individual collective dichotomy restricts the possibilities for analysing multiple agents in shared social context. So to me, this suggests a rationale for the two different modes of presentation of the collective mind in Patrick's paper and in the MMH generally, and that this is a potentially productive distinction. Right. More speculatively, or in sort of specific detail, could this open up the possibility of a new form of economic reasoning for MMH? Well, I don't know. I'm not an expert in MMH. But one or two things that occur to me. Um, herd behaviour is very interesting. Well, an intersubjective analysis of herd behaviour would be interesting because you're not thinking, well, what do I do, given what everyone else does? But you see that each of us is making a decision as to what to do, given that each of us is, fa is, is facing this change in market conditions. So it's as if there's a kind of a mutuality introduced into the analysis that does not in any way um, detract from the fact that it's individuals who make decisions um, on the basis of what they perceive is best for them individually. So in a, in a sense, maybe it kind of, it marries up a way of moving away from the individualism of the extreme individualist approach um, without jettisoning the assumptions of individual rationality that motivate a lot of, I take it, market analysis and a lot of economic analysis too. Okay, so that's... Our next uh, speaker is going to be Soren Overgar, an uh, associate professor from uh, Copenhagen University. And uh, he's going to give a talk on what is it like uh, to be a group. OK, so thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I know absolutely nothing about markets, I should say that. Uh, I know just a little bit about groups, nothing about markets. Buying a car for me was a nightmare. Um, I, I'm here really because I want to know about this really interesting hypothesis, market mind hypothesis. And so I did read uh, Patrick's primer with, um, with interest. And I'll, I'll return to that towards the end. First of all, um, this is based on what I'm going to say before I turn to my wild speculations on market minds. Uh, is based on something I did with a friend of mine, Alessandro Salice from Cork. Um, and um, what I'm going to present is, is a small part of a much larger, larger argument. So the larger argument goes something like this. Lots of people think, well, lots, I don't know, but some people think that groups can have minds of their own. So over and above the the minds of the individuals. They can have their own beliefs that maybe aren't shared by any individual member of the group, and so on. Um, now, in the first part of this paper, we choose belief as a kind of paradigm mental state to, to as it were, test this group uh, mind hypothesis on. And we argue that if you want groups to have beliefs of their own, they had better have the ability to consciously activate those beliefs somehow. And then the next part of the argument is, now it seems like if you want group beliefs, you need group consciousness of some sort. And then the next question is, which sort? And that's basically where this um, presentation starts. OK, so uh, yeah. So now we're already kind of assuming and and I'm, I'm, it's OK to assume this, because there are people who think groups can have consciousness of a certain kind, or conscious states of a certain kind. So I'm not sort of stacking the cards against them. Um, so there are kind of two ways in which you could uh, try and uh, maintain that groups can have conscious states. You could uh, go for the what I call the strong group mind thesis, Groups can have phenomenally conscious states of their own. So then there would be something it's like to be the group. They might have their own moods, their own phenomenal states or episodes, right? And maybe no individual member 
of the group would have an episode of that kind. So that's the kind of strong claim. And the weaker claim, which is what I'm going to focus on, is groups can have conscious states, but not in the full-fledged phenomenal sense. So in some other sense, which I'll label access consciousness after um, an American philosopher, Ned Block, who may not be familiar to, to all of you. Anyway, so that's the idea. Um, so my, I'm trying, I'll try to basically persuade you that you can't sort of separate these, these two senses of consciousness, at least not easily. So that seems to suggest then that if you want groups to have something like access consciousness, consciousness in some sense, or conscious states in some sense, then you should be prepared to think of groups as having their own phenomenally conscious states. Now, I'll just, I'll return to this point. There are two ways you can go if you buy this argument that I'm presenting to you. You can, you can either argue in a modus ponens fashion. We have reason to think groups can be conscious. And I've suggested if, you have, if groups can be conscious, they can be phenomenal conscious. So you conclude then that they can be phenomenally conscious. Other people might think this is a, something like a reductio of the view, right? So since it's obviously ridiculous to claim that groups can be phenomenally conscious, we should reject the claim that they can be conscious at all. And I'm not really going to take a stand on, on uh, which way you should go, but I'll, I'll return to this in the context of the market mind hypothesis. Right, so this is it. First, I'll say a little bit about the group consciousness thesis, or GCT, and then I'll, I'll present my brief argument against that thesis, and then I'll speculate wildly on matters I know nothing about. So that's going to be the interesting bit. So the idea is that um, groups can um, have conscious states of their own, right, over and above the conscious states of the individuals. It's not um, particularly controversial to claim that individual people can have conscious states, right? The interesting thing is, can groups have their own conscious states over and above the states of the individuals? Um, now, I'll just say this is distinct from the group mind thesis as such, because you, you might think there could be mental states that don't require consciousness at all, and perhaps groups could instantiate some of those. But um, as I mentioned, so I won't be arguing for this, we, we try and sort of argue that if, if you're attracted to that thesis, then you'd better be prepared to accept some kind of group consciousness. Um, but that's for another day. Uh, now it seems as though most philosophers who like the idea of a group mind or group level mental states don't really like the idea of group consciousness. I'm not going to read that. I want to be able to speculate um, also. But, but sometimes they say something that sounds a lot like, we want mentality, group mentality. We don't want group level consciousness. But then some of the same people also sometimes say, well, groups can have states that are access, access conscious. So they, have, they can have consciousness in some sense, just not the phenomenal sense. So they can't feel pain, right? And they can't, you know, enjoy the uh, s smell, smell of roses or whatever, right? Um, but they can have access consciousness. Awareness is another phrase sometimes used that comes from David Chalmers. Um, but it, it's, it refers to the same thing as, as what Ned Block calls access consciousness, or at least um, we can assume that that's so um, here. So what's going on? Well, they are relying on this distinction between acts, what uh, Ned Block calls phenomenal consciousness or P consciousness, sometimes just P. Um, basically, the idea is that state is phenomenally conscious when there's something it's like in this famous phrase to be in that state or if you like, it's a state that has phenomenal properties. It feels a certain way, right? Um, it has certain experiential properties. There are different things that we can try to say to kind of gesture at, at what's going on without really 
giving a definition. Um, Annette Bloch likes to quote Louis Armstrong, I think it is, and and say, you know, if you if you gotta ask, you ain't never gonna know. So if you if you really have to ask what phenomenal consciousness is, then you know you'll never find out because there's nothing I can say that will really kind of give you a definition if you're not already with me when I'm when I've said this much. Okay, so what are access conscious states or a conscious states? Well, Block has different ways of of kind of spelling this out, but he says. A state is a conscious if it or I think sometimes also he says it, it's content. It's not nothing's going to turn on that. I think um, is globally broadcast or poised for free use in thinking and the guidance of action. Um, and he also says that this. What does that mean to be poised for free use? It's something in between mere availability and actual use, or, or actually being accessed. Okay, um, and so it seems that a lot of these people, I didn't read the quotes, but trust me on this, they defend what I want to call weak group consciousness, the weak group, group consciousness thesis. So groups can have access conscious states, but not phenomenally conscious states. So the challenge for this kind of view is you need to make it plausible that anything, I mean, it, it isn't really, doesn't really depend on groups specifically, that anything can have um, A conscious states without even potentially having P conscious states. For their ideas, no, P consciousness P conscious states, that's not something that groups can have. They can have these access conscious states. Um, and um, there, are, there are some things that certainly won't do the job. So the, just the conceptual distinction between A consciousness and P consciousness isn't going to help because you can have water is a different concept, famously from H2O. But that doesn't mean that the two are distinct. Um, and if, if it just turns out that phenomenally, phenomenal consciousness is the same thing as access consciousness, then um, that's certainly not good news if you want to maintain that groups can have one thing but not the other, because there's only one thing. There aren't two. And there are some other things that won't work uh, as well. So Bloch himself suggests that there are um, actual cases of states that are a consciousness without a conscious without being p conscious in his first argument for the distinction he had a a case of the so-called super blind sighted person which was not an actual case but in a later paper he refers to something which at least he thinks is might be an actual case and uh, it's something he calls reverse anton syndrome i know nothing about this except what block writes there but apparently it's a patient who regards himself as blind in a certain part of his visual field, despite being able, or, or totally blind, I think. That's the, that's the way he presents it, I think. So he, he regards himself as completely blind, but he has the ability to read um, text in a certain part of his visual field. And, um, and the, the, the patient apparently says, well, I, you know, I, I don't see a, see a thing. It's just these thoughts or ideas pop up in my head, right? So apparently the patient just knows what's there without being able, without having any idea of how he knows, and certainly without having an experience of seeing anything uh, in that location. Okay, well, that may be good-ish news for the um, weak group consciousness thesis, but it doesn't really help it. Um, at the end of the day, right? Because just because an individual like this patient who certainly has the ability to have phenomenally conscious states and episodes can have some states that are uh, A-conscious without being P-conscious, that doesn't yet tell us whether something like a group which supposedly is, is not able to have phenomenally conscious states at all, right, can have a conscious state.
So that's no help either, really. Now, Bloch himself rejects the idea that creatures without P-consciousness can have access consciousness. And he does so because he says that phenomenal consciousness is the core notion of consciousness and access consciousness is parasitic upon it the way a parquet floor is parasitic on another floor beneath it. That's his own uh, image. And uh, it's important moving forward. Now I'm going to present a, or sketch a sort of argument for why I think Bloch is, is right to think in this way. Um, but uh, before I do that, um, it's important to say that access consciousness is supposed to be, this is how Bloch presents it, it's supposed to be a, a commonsensical notion of consciousness. So it's supposed to be intuitive and it's supposed to be a notion of consciousness that plays a deep role, he says, in our ordinary thought about consciousness. Okay, so the idea of, of uh, A consciousness is an A conscious state or its content is ready or poised for free use in reasoning. Now the question is, what does that mean? So here's one of Bloch's examples, or it sort of fits both the blind, super blindsided person and the reverse Anton's syndrome patient. So the idea is there's a, there's a in his examples, there's a visual state some, somewhere in the visual system, whatever, which has a certain content. Let's say there is a um, yellow crescent-shaped object over there or something like that. Now, there's no phenomenal experience of seeing a yellow crescent-shaped thing over there, right? Then the state would be phenomenally conscious, right? So, but what happens in Bloch's examples is that the content of that state kind of pops up in, in, uh, in people's heads. So there's a conscious thought that occurs seemingly out of nowhere with that content. There's a yellow crescent shaped thing over there or something like that. So these concepts Con contents then, in, in Bloch's examples at least, right, are accessed in, in conscious thought. Now, and I'm going to take it that, that that must at least be possible for this to be access consciousness. Remember, it's supposed to be an intuitive notion of consciousness, right, that we can all relate to. So it must at least be possible to access in thought these contents that are poised for free use in precisely thought. So unless we can, can also access them and they're not just dangling there forever, right? it's not going to be uh, access consciousness, or so I take it. So what does that mean then to access these contents in, in thought, in, in, indeed in conscious thought? So what does it mean to actually use them? Right? We know that they're poised for use, if they are a conscious at all, right? But what does it mean to actually use them to to um, to access them in in thought? And in particular, of course, does that mean something that is going to include phenomenal consciousness, or is it only can can we make do again only with this notion of access consciousness? Now, if you're a group consciousness weak group consciousness thesis person, right? You're, you're going to want to be able to make sense of this only in terms of access consciousness. So, so these thoughts then, in which you access what was poised for free use, right? Because of the access conscious uh, visual state, right? Are themselves going to be A conscious states, not P conscious states. So that means then that they or their content, there is a yellow crescent shaped thing over there, again, that's going to be poised for free use in thought. But crucially, you're not going to have an experience, right? There's no 
phenomenal consciousness here. You're not going to have an experience of thinking that there's a yellow crescent shaped thing over there. But then, what does that mean? Well, it means, again, it seems to me and to Alessandro, that these thoughts or their content would still not be used. Right? It would still just be poised for use in thought. It would still not be used, still not accessed. So it seems as though we've still not kind of been able to account for what it actually, what it might mean to access or use in thought the content. There's a yellow crescent shaped thing over there. <laughs> for recall, this, all this talk about uh, the, co the content of a state being globally broadcast or poised for use does not mean it is actually accessed or used, right? It's ready to be used, but it's not used. So it seems to me that as long as, as all we get in the picture here is, is a consciousness, then we can never really make sense of of, of uh, these contents being actually used in thought or accessed in, 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 in conscious thought. Yeah, I'm going to skip this. I want to get to the market stuff, which probably interests uh, you more. OK, but what's the point? This is a very short and shortened version of a long argument that's supposed to convince you that, um, that we need even to account for access consciousness, right, given that it's an intuitive notion of consciousness here that, that Bloch wants, to, uh, wants this term to, uh, to pinpoint, um, we need something like phenomenal consciousness in the picture. Otherwise, all we get are these sort of endless iterations of content that's sort of poised for use but never actually used, right, that's ready to be accessed but never really accessed, and so on. And so the idea is, um, if you want A-conscious states, you, you need to be prepared uh, to accept P-conscious states. So if you want groups to, be, to have A-conscious states, then you should bite the bullet and accept that they can also have P-conscious states. And that goes against the, um, the weak group consciousness thesis. Okay, I have four minutes left, and I really want to uh, get to this wild speculation here. So remember, if, if I'm right about this, and I might be wrong, of course, right? all I've tried to say now, if, if groups can have access conscious states, then they should also be able to have phenomenally conscious states. That's just a conditional. What do we, where do we go from here? Right, and there are two obvious ways you might go. The modus ponens way, well, we have good reason to think groups can have access consciousness. Now, given the conditional I've just put on the table, then let's conclude that they can probably also have phenomenally conscious states. Or you could argue in a modus tollens fashion, it's absurd to suggest that groups can literally have phenomenally conscious states, that there is something it's like to be a group. That's absurd. Right? And given the conditional I've put on the table now, what you should conclude is it's absurd to think of them as having access conscious states. Now, I'm not going to um, argue either in a modus ponens or modus tollens fashion here. Um, although one thing I, I do want to suggest is that one of the, as far as I can gather, kind of most hip uh, theories of consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, currently uh, the, the so-called uh, integrated information theory um, invented by Tononi and, and collaborators. Um, now, on that theory, there must be something really wrong, I think, at least if we take it at face value with the idea of, of group phenomenal consciousness, because it's a feature of the theory, if I've understood it correctly, that in a system, Consciousness arises where the integrated information reaches a maximum, right? So the only way that groups of individual subjects can have phenomenally conscious states is if it's at the group level that the integration of information reaches a maximum, 
So that means all the individuals then can't be phenomenally conscious. And that's, that ought to be pretty absurd, it seems to me, right? Just by being a member of a, of a very integrated group of, what do I know, friends or sports fans, or uh, there's a bunch of Danish drinkers uh, on the flight to Edinburgh, probably whiskey fans, you know. It doesn't mean you lose, con well, it can mean you lose consciousness, but for other reasons, just by being a men member of the group, you don't lose your ability to feel and uh, so on. Right, so that's crazy. Now, of course there are things you can say, and Schwitzgebel, uh, an American philosopher who thinks it's not crazy to speak of group phenomenal consciousness, he has reasons to, or he thinks he can attack this idea of Tononis and, un and undermine it. The question I want to raise here, though, though, sort of leaving groups behind, could the market mind hypothesis fare better? And here I want, this is where it gets speculative, so I, I, and I only have one minute. So, so one thing, I'll, I'll ju I just want to make a few comments on uh, Patrick's uh, primer, which I read with great interest. Um, and um, so, so, so Patrick, is very interested in whether or not we should be dualists or physicalists, materialists, that's the same as physicalist, or at least according to many people, or what, right? And a lot seems to hang on this. I don't, I'm not able to see, maybe I haven't read it carefully enough, that so much hangs on this, at least not directly. It seems that what, what you want is market mentality that, I think this is one of the things you want, at least, that can sort of, can be causally ef effective, can have causal effects in the physical world, right? And that, of course, takes you in the sort of territory where philosophers have discussed whether we should be dualists or what. Can we get that if we're dualists, right? That's the old Cartesian problem. Um, but um, but it, it doesn't mean, I, I, I don't quite see why you need to worry so much about that. Leave it to the philosophers. One thing I want to suggest, and this is what I'll end with, um, that perhaps would be an interesting metaphysical question to consider, is whether the market mind hypothesis, and I took it as the, strong, the strongest version, kind of the minds can have moods with phenomenal fields of their own, kind of, right? Uh, could it fare better than... Could, or, or does it also have a problem, at least if we buy Tononi's account with? And um, the, the reason why I think the group consciousness thesis gets a problem here is that groups consist of individual people. So once you calculate, so if that's the system and the components of the system are individual people, then when you calculate the, where the integrated information reaches a maximum in the system, if that's not on the individual level, but on the group level, then individuals can't be conscious. So my question now is, what? so groups then consist of individual people. What do markets consist of? I have no ideas. Transactions, the exchange of goods. I, of course there are individuals, there are individual agents on the markets, investors. So yeah, I have no idea whether, I'm even making sense because I know nothing about this. But, it, but it's, it's not clear to me that markets are groups of individuals the way the Danish Drinkers Club is a group consisting of individuals. So, so I would want, if, if I wanted to think more about the market mind hypothesis, I would want to think about the metaphysics of a market. What is a market? What does it consist of? There are people who make bits and stuff, I, s I assume, and computers that do it automatically, whatever, I don't know, right? But what are the components like? I don't think a market has to be like a group, a collection of individuals with a certain cohesion or whatever. So what are they? That would be fun to think about, I think. Yeah, what are the parts that make up the market? Sorry, I've been going on for far too long already. But thank you for your attention.
Uh, now, thank you very much for these talks, very interesting and inspiring. And in, in the light of what we have been listening to this morning, I would like to uh, s take my starting point from Vivian's uh, anthropomorphism and uh, from, my, from what I would call individualism that came up both in Vivian's talk and in Søren's talk. It seems to me we are having some kind of dilemma here. And that is a version of the mind-body metaphysical dualism that has been with us for centuries. Vivian has raised the metaphysical questions of how to individuate uh, players in game theory or agents on the market and suggested that there's an alternative between just looking at individual agents and the whole group of people that there's something in between that uh, people can shape smaller groups who coordinate uh, their behavior. Yeah. In this context, I would like to remind you that even the notion of a person is a social construction. It goes back to uh, at least the Roman times. Uh, a person is tailor-made for legal purposes. The person is an individual, rational agent who can be held responsible for her or his, mostly his actions, who uh, has intentions, uh, who can anticipate uh, consequences of his actions, and uh, who is expected to uh, operate in accordance with the social and legal norms of the society. This is not a natural way of uh, thinking of agents, but it is a socially constructed agent. But this morning, we heard where the natural origin of this has to be localized, namely babies learn to be individual agents by interacting with the world. They learn to conceive of themselves as agents who are in control of their bodies and of the small environment in which they live, like rattles. And um, so we, uh, but, but then when we, uh, when we try to inquire into the dynamics of a market or a group of people, things get somehow complicated. Um, and um, we, it seems to me that we have to uphold the self-conception that we learn as babies. And it's psychologically very important for us to think of ourselves as agents who uh, can think and anticipate uh, what they are doing, who have consciousness, who think in terms of beliefs of P and non-P, want uh, to hold true beliefs, as if they were alone uh, in power to decide what to think, what to believe, and what to do. It seems that we preserve the self-conception of a baby, and on the level of the baby that might be quite adequate, when we pers persist with the self-conception once we move into a larger world and become members of groups who uh, are in involved in complex interactions, and there the self-conception becomes increasingly more inadequate, because we can think of uh, human societies as of complex systems, where the interaction is not really uh, in the hands of the individual. And uh, the market mind hypothesis, I think, is uh, with all the questions that Vivian and Søren have raised, reveals this dilemma. So on the one hand, we have a complex uh, system, which is dynamic and which uh, develops dynamics beyond the control of the individual agents. But those who interfere in the market can hardly accept that. So we just heard someone who said, what are we going to do about that? As if they could do something about that individually. But it's, uh, so psychologists tell us that if we lose the self-conception of agents who can actively interfere in the world and take control of things, uh, we can't live anymore. Uh, it's traumatic, actually, to le le uh, to leave that self-conception behind. So I would like to invite you to uh, to say something about this uh, dilemma of the uh, our inevitability of thinking about ourselves as agents. On the other hand, we are just little um, 
places of uh, dynamic systems uh, in a complex of dynamic systems and uh, just contribute to the functioning of the system as a whole without having any control of the details of that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly the um, market manager hypothesis has raised mm -hmm. some possibly difficult questions. Sorry. Market mind hypothesis is raising some incredibly interesting and difficult questions. Um, I think my own personal take in thinking about issues of agency is that it, for me, it kind of makes no sense to think about agency unless in some kind of social context. Um, so the notion of you know, the Cartesian individual is somehow unreal for human beings even that baby you know the baby didn't just happen to be in a pram of, sorry didn't just happen to be in that cot with the um, the toy just happening to be above it and the tether just happening to be there you know linking the leg to the rattle so that it could just happen to have fun um, the baby is already in a social situation the baby became was the baby was starting the process of being socialized from the very moment it was born and it was interacting with other people, um, looks, smiles, touch, incredibly important, touch and feel, smells. And it seems to me inconceivable and therefore kind of really going off on a wrong pathway if we, if we try to develop a notion of agent as a kind of single isolated being. Any individual baby that was abandoned, uh, sorry, uh, abandoned, that's a, it's a, a word that's sort of, um, in, suggestive in the wrong way. Any, no single baby could thrive unless brought up in some kind of human environment, whether it's a biological family or some other social gathering. And it, so it's already, from the moment of birth, a baby is socialised in some way or another and differently according to historical circumstances um, and um, the amount of care um, and, and um, stimulating experiences that they, that they have. Um, so it seems to me that sort of relating this now to the market mind hypothesis is a very specific question. Um, I think in a way what I was suggesting was that I don't think that the standard notion of an individual is much use in what I call shared social context. We have multiple agents in shared social context. Um, because by stripping out the social context, you strip out everything that's of interest. So in a way, what I was doing was suggesting the intersubjective approach is that some kind of intersubjective relations are appropriate whenever we are thinking about human beings in any kind of social context, which is kind of all the time, really. Um, even in our moments of isolation, you know, sitting in our study trying to work or, you know, a lonely walk, uh, we're carrying in our heads, you know, the memories of, of interactions and the, the hopes and aspirations for future interactions. And without that, you know, Adam Smith said, I mean, it, it's, um, and it seems to be kind of commonsensical, really, that it's impossible to imagine somebody brought up um, without contact with other people. So it seems to me that the advantage of the subjective approach is it helps us to explore the various dimensions of that in different situations, and the MMH is one. Thinking about the market as the collective entity, as a sort of a singular entity, I hadn't thought of, and it's interesting that we were inter in interpreting that differently, I hadn't thought of that in terms of sort of human beings, but in terms of the data of the market. Um, thinking it has a cognitive system in terms of the prices of the market, quantities traded of the market, exchange rates of the market, um, forecasts of profitability of the markets. So I can kind of, that seems to me okay. I mean, that's, that presumably we've got investors here, we've got financial analysts here. That's what these guys analyze. They have masses of data which refers to these things. And they're not looking at data about people. They're looking at data about transactions and prices and things. So. I can kind of live with that distinction for MMH. That kind of makes sense both from an economics point of view and from a sort of a human agency point of view. But maybe that's just my own sort of idiosyncratic take on it. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I, I haven't thought too much about agen agency, to be honest. Yeah, but but, but uh, I kind of, I, I like this idea of the intersubjective level as a sort of mid 
that you outlined in your talk. So as a kind of, um, you know, so the, unlike the two of you, I'm not a historian of philosophy or of anything else uh, for that matter. But, you know, you know, this sort of standard uh, state of nature kind of thinking where, you know, first we have these individuals, they're like, you know, splendidly isolated people. And then we have to give an account of how they can get together and do something together. And that's very difficult if you're Thomas Hobbes in the, uh, you know, after the Civil War of England and so on. Um, so that, that on the one hand is kind of doesn't seem like a good place to start if you want to account for agency. It doesn't seem like a good place to start that we have some kind of super geist that's sort of, you know, where individuals just become little dominoes uh, somehow. So, so that kind of mid-level where we're, you know, we're, we're interconnected and to the extent that we become people, it is as a result of the interaction, interactions we've had with caregivers and later also with friends and so on, since we were uh, babies, basically. So I like that idea. Can, uh, yeah. Just a short question that I wanted to raise about your approach. In the paper, you didn't talk about that today. You, uh, you uh, talk about this uh, mind to world direction of fit. Uh, yeah. So we want to form true beliefs on the basis of evidence. Um, and there I thought that the intersubjective element is really missing because the evidence on which we rely for forming our beliefs, uh, that is not an evidence that we have collected ourselves. Right. I mean, we lie to a very large extent on uh, other people as sources of information about, uh, and then we decide about what to believe. Yeah, no, that, ab absolutely. So that's just a point about what a belief is. So it's it's a really abstract point. Like the, if you think like what is the dif what is the distinction between a belief and a desire? A belief, the 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 idea of a belief, it's supposed to reflect what things are like out there. A desire is not supposed to reflect what things are like. Then you know, desiring a promotion would be silly, because you know I'm not I haven't been promoted. But that's the whole point of a desire. Is it's the world that has to change to fit what's in my mind, and the the idea of direction of fit. Um, so, and the the idea that the uh, that beliefs have this uh, mind to world direction of fit is is simply this that the whole point of a belief is to fit what's in the mind, so that it it matches the state of the world. So that thesis in and of itself doesn't say anything about how we come to acquire the beliefs that we have about the world and whether or not social um, interaction plays a role. And I think you're absolutely right. It plays an enormous role. And, you know, we have all these echo chambers on the Internet where we're just endlessly confirming uh, views, you know, with like-minded people, views that we share and and we somehow think we get wiser, and but we're just moving in circles, right? A lot of the time, anyway. Can, can I interject just one small on, on, on agency? A true story, a friend of mine took her little daughter, she was, I think, four at the time, to an animal farm, and she was completely taken by the horse. She had these huge black eyes, shiny, the whole world reflected in them, and, and she asked her, Mommy, how can I see the world from the eyes of the horse? I, I can see the world like the horse. And then his mother said, you know, I'm afraid it's impossible. And she started crying. And this is a story. But so there is this, there's a, say, a reason for the crying. Yeah, and uh, I mean, inquiring into the workings of the market, what's the point of that? Is that then just like there's an animal and that's moving around? And we just wonder how it does that? Or do we uh, want to understand how it works so that we can actively interfere and prevent certain crises and move it in the right direction, whatever the right direction is? And this is, again, where the perspective of the individual agent comes in. I mean, as much as I agree with Vivian that there is not really an individual without a group uh, around it, we localize, and that's the point with the persona, we localize responsibility on the individual level and also the effect of being bound by norms. I mean, 
when we look at complex systems and how they interact, there is no normativity at all. It just does what it does, whether we like it or not. May I just, may I just offer a little correction there, because obviously I, I wasn't clear on what one thing I was saying. Um, I don't think, I hope I wasn't saying that we can't, in, we can't envisage an individual agent except in the context of being part of a group. I don't think I would use the notion of a group in that sense. My own personal view on that is I think that um, certainly in English we are very, ex we are very um, extravagant in, the, in using a group. Very often we use group just to mean some people, a plural number of people. Um, and it doesn't suggest anything about any kind of groupness or collectivity in that sense. You know, I can say, you know, there's some students outside the window making a noise. Or I could say, there's a bunch of students outside my window making a noise. I don't really mean there's a bunch of students. I could say there's a group of students. If I say there's a group of students, I take that to mean that if, if there's a group as such, there is, it is functioning as a collective in some sense, that they agreed to be outside my window and make a noise, right? But just some some students who happen to be outside my window and doing something, or some people out in the street going about their business, I wouldn't call that a group. I would just say that that's, that's some, some people doing something. And I mean, I wonder whether this might contribute to the discussion that Soren was um, explaining to us. What is it like to be a group? And I wonder whether um, in, in that discussion, the notion of a group is some kind of collective entity that is separate from the, um, the individual members who make up the group. Whereas very often in ordinary language when we talk about a group, we don't mean a group in that sense, we just mean some people. And if I could just say one other thing, I think the notion of plural, using the, it's, it's an argument in philosophy that I, I've recently discovered that I think is really, really interesting. And it says that, and it's also in the history of philosophy and maths. And they said that logically there has been a singularist bias in logic and mathematics that was introduced at a particular moment of time according to which multiple items are analysed in singular terms. And these people say, well, actually, it's more natural to theorise these items in plural terms. And so they've introduced ways of thinking about plural logic that is perfectly acceptable. And it seems to me that one of the advantages of the notion of each of us that I tried to introduce and explain the advantages of can be interpreted as a variant of a plural approach. So in terms of game theory, it seems to me that a really interesting point is that game theory is reliant on set theory. Set theory is an example of philosophical singularism because it analyzes multiple items as members of a set. And even though the expression members of a set, we use the vernacular plural, actually each member is separated and is analysed in singular terms. And it's that that underlies, say, the unilateralism of game theory that causes it so much problems. And I wonder whether that problem is actually... Uh, some of those issues is... Sorry, I'm waving this around. Some of those issues are evident in discussions around the market mind hypothesis. It's partly that ordinary discourse in English is very confused about these different things, but also that there is this philosophical tradition of prioritising the singular over taking entities plurally. And, you know, that might be an input to discussion. So thank you for your, your comments. Uh, I guess we're, we're ready if anyone has uh, questions. Or? Uh, what you think? Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your talks. Um, uh, and very, very thought-provoking. Um, I, uh, I I liked very much, uh, Vivian, the idea of uh, breaking away from the dichotomy of the individual and the collective. Uh, this maybe relates to levels. Uh, an individual is a collective, after all. A cell is a collective, right? It's a collective of proteins and all kinds of things. So, so uh, the individual is a collective and the collective is an individual. Um, uh, I think there's a missing concept here. And the missing concept, I think, has to do with synergy. 
and interpersonal synergy, for example. There's a lot of work on this, by the way. Um, and uh, early work, for example, by Maynard Smith and uh, Zav Mary, introduced a, 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 a different kind of take on the defect, uh, the, the defector. They have a rowing example where you have uh, uh, two rowers uh, trying to get across a stream, and they each have two oars, of course, and uh, one can defect, but they can still get across the stream, right? Now, if instead you have a sculling arrangement and one defects, where, it, where each has one oar each and they defect, then the boat goes round in circles and nothing happens. So there are moves, uh, for example, by Peter Corning, who's written a book called Synergistic Selection, uh, with many, many examples where the group uh, has to work synergistically to produce a cooperative effect. Uh, in that case, I would say when you see uh, synergizing, that's a oneness in a way. And nevertheless, it's composed of uh, uh, multiple uh, individuals, perhaps intra-acting uh, after Karen Barrett, uh, who uh, writes on the notion of intra-action, that we're not actually separate from our environment. That environment can, can, can include, as, as you pointed out and others have pointed out, with uh, respect to mothers and babies, a social environment. It can, uh, it can be a, the environment where it's well controlled, like I mentioned this morning. Uh, so uh, it turns out that the dynamics of these things are uh, actually shared, uh, despite the fact that the other uh, could be another person, or it could be a machine. In fact, there are human-machine studies like this. We we called it virtual partners, actually. So, so you can create these synergies, uh, uh, where the synergy now means a unitary group. So I'm just trying to th to provoke the discussion. Uh, I like very much the the this this whole point that it's uh, it's a mistake to. Uh, dichotomize the individual and the collective. Uh, but I do think that uh, we can see the collective in terms of uh, uh, a, a synergistic unit, and that, in fact, synergistic units are what are selected evolutionarily because you need the cooperation. Uh, if you don't cooperate, you don't get selected. which I will look into. I, hadn't, I really hadn't thought about that at all. But if I could just comment on the specific examples. When I was making the distinction between individual and collective, I was, the, the, I was comparing them with respect to the same things. So it was in terms of an, an individual person. Again, the language is very, you know, we talk about a person as an individual. So for me, the distinction between an individual person and a collective of people. Um, um, but clearly, there can be you can have individual the notion of individual ranging over a number of things, and the notion of collective ranging over a number of things. Um, in terms of the rowing example, that that's interesting. In terms of coordination, what I would suggest from my own work on game theory, which in a sense is kind of preliminary, and it's I mean I'm not a game theorist. I've sort of come in from outside. Um, there are two ways of thinking about cooperation over the rowing, so that they row in a straight line rather than just go round around in circles. One is that um, the, the two individual rowers could work out for themselves what is the best thing to do. And what I've argued is that with, the intercept, in, with using an intersubjective approach, it is possible to do that. And I think that's much more problematic for standard game theory. Because if you're thinking in terms of each of us, what it's best for each of us to do, that changes the situation from what is best for me to do. Um, given what you're going, what you're doing, and then the other guy is thinking the same thing, and then they they, they go around in <laughs> they go around in circles mentally <laughs> rather than physically in the boat, but they might also be going around physically. But the other thing is if they if they do form a team in some sense uh, or a collective in some sense, um, and then they operate as a team, um, you know, because they've done it before. Say that might be the circumstance, and they 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 know from habit and practice and shared practice and shared habit. Um, but that, of course, stands outside game theory. It strictly doesn't um, doesn't involve notions of team team players. Strictly, it's individual players. Work, of course, are on teams. 
Oh yes, and and as, as as a way of adapting game theory to meet more um, everyday examples and practical considerations. Yes, indeed, the work of Barak, um, um, uh, Sugden, and um, Barak. I've got the name. Um, oh, mental blip. Um, yes, with good work. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Michael there. I have a rem uh, thank you first for the stimulating talks. It made me think about the concept of group consciousness. And uh, it made me also think about another concept that's called type three error, <coughs> which is finding the right answer to the wrong question. So could it be that the idea, the question, does do groups have consciousness is the wrong question? So just to suggest another one, uh, do groups have culture, meaning something stable that's going on even if the members change? Huh? And that seems to be something that where we have good evidence for. And that holds not only for the Vatican for a long time, but it holds also for, for research groups, for instance. So in my research group, we had a number of heuristic rules, hmm? like tea at four o'clock every day. And no, nobody's forced to go there. But the director, in this case myself, I just went there every time. Hmm? Open doors, everyone on one floor, because if it's on different floors, then communication is yeah, decreasing. And so a number of rules that set a culture and which persisted at the Max Planck Institute where I work uh, for 20 years. And there was nobody left from the original group, but the, the culture was embedded in the heuristic rules that, that were just there and were transported. And that may also be a case for certain markets that have certain cultures. And they, then the question is, are they changed or are they resistant against change? So here is a suggestion for a different kind of question. I would just like to uh, to wonder whether uh, in a team like that the people are not really performing as individuals but as bearers of certain roles. Uh, and uh, so when you have a role that needs to be played, it doesn't really matter who plays it as long as the person does what she is expected to do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I think that's, especially the market version, I, I imagine would be a really interesting question to ask. So I, I, I would think from a, I'm a philosopher, so I like questions that aren't too easy to, <laughs> to figure out, you know, what to what what the, where it's not too easy to figure out what the right reply is, and I would just be so surprised if groups couldn't have a culture that could survive individual members, if that sort of thing never happened, that would strike me as as a very very strange and implausible outcome. So so I would kind of think that the the answer to your question is, is clearly must be a yes, right? Um, so maybe my maybe this question about group consciousness is not a good one because. It's certainly not if you think the answer is clearly a no. So the good questions would be ones where we don't really know whether it's... And uh, maybe the market mind hypothesis raises a question of that sort, where... If I may add to the test, you, uh, you assume that the culture of the group is living on. But it, that it can do that, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And so philosophers like talking about rational agents responding to reasons. And I imagine that the group 
is constitutive of reasons to which the individuals respond. Like the others are going for tea, so I'm going as well. If I was alone, I would probably not be going. But since the others are going, and this is how conventions come into being. Uh, so we have a shared interest. Nobody can satisfy the interest on her or his own. We have to coordinate, but nobody knows how it does it intentionally. It just happens. One, one last question. Thank you for your very interesting talks. Um, this is a question for both of you. So in a way, you both were hostile to the idea of a group mind. And I kind of get that if we think about group minds in terms of mental, of, of experience and phenomenology and phenomenal quality and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but what about cognitive systems? And you did mention that, that perhaps we could be more open to that idea about group cognitive systems. So, and I'm saying this because, you know, cognitive scientists, many of them study groups of people mm -hmm. in terms of distributed cognition, and some of them they're explicit that in such cases you might have distributed cognitive systems. And recently there was also a study in scientific reports um, demonstrating that a simulation of a beehive uh, manifests the same psychophysical laws that uh, individuals, individual humans manifest when they engage in decision making. So Pierron's law, Weber's law, Hickheimer's law. And that's a strong um, evidence that, you know, there is at least one distributed cognitive system, the beehive, um, that qualifies as such. And, you know, the beehive is also an economy, maybe not a market, but it is an economy. So would you be open to that? Uh, Slightly weaker claim, but you know, ontologically strong enough. Thank you. I s see no reason in principle uh, to to be against that, and uh, um, and I mean, so w I, I think once we lose the tie to consciousness, especially phenomenal consciousness, um, I think it becomes a lot less clear that there's anything wrong with. You know, there are also philosophers who are perfectly happy to, s to ascribe intentionality to um, thermostats, for instance, that they have some kind of intentionality, they monitor the state of the room and, and yeah, whatever, something like that. And, uh, and I think, so maybe even if you, yeah, no, l let me just say that. So, so the idea of cognitive system that as such has a kind of mentality um, I find a lot less um, sort of intuitively repelling, if, if that's the right way to phrase it. Uh, and and I, I think really, I, I think consciousness plays a huge role directly or indirectly in the kinds of intuitions we might have that go against also the market mind hypothesis. This you know, the, the market itself having moods with a certain phenomenal character. That's where I think the, our intuitions, you know, start to, to rebel kind of against it. And uh, once you lose that tie, it becomes much less problematic, at least kind of from an intuitive point of view. Um, thank you for, Thank you for your question. It's a very central question, isn't it, to the, uh, the market mind hypothesis? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, I think what I was trying to do is to question whether the notion of mind is the most appropriate, because it seems to me that for us, it seems to be inevitably the notion of being minded comes with a lot of other stuff, anthropomorphic stuff, including, you know, moods and consciousness. And I was asking the question, is that what the MMH proponents really want. Because on the one hand, they were saying that, you know, the notion of mind in market mind is as a cognitive system, um, and they emphasize the importance of notions of 4E and extended minds. Um, in spite of that, you know, they were at the same time using um, anthropogenic language and talking about moods and intentions. And it just seemed to me that, um, and I did propose, well, maybe if you call it, you know, market as cognitive system. I mean, it's not such a pretty expression and you lose the alliteration, but maybe it's more accurate and less liable to be misunderstood and also less liable to introduce by force of association 
all sorts of other things that aren't really meant to be there. Um, so I was suggesting, well, maybe one could think, you know, if the, if the collective entity notion of um, the mind is, is thought of in terms of the, as a, a, a cognitive system, in terms of sort of the, the bundles of data on you know, prices and whatever, and the mood and the consciousness side of it can be thought about intersubjectively. Because I think, again, in ordinary language, when we talk about the market, one minute you're talking about the formal characteristics of the market by saying, you know, the market went up today. What you mean is the price went in a particular direction. Um, but yet when we talk about the market, we also talk about the market participants. And it's just a basic ambiguity in language. And I suppose I was suggesting the way that if you're going to do kind of some formal analysis, it's quite useful to separate, separate out the, you know, the different everyday notions of what is a market. Um, whether that will resolve all your problems, of course, that's, you know, it's a huge issue and lots of philosophical and other, other questions has been, I think, illustrated by all the papers today. Um, but, uh, yeah, but it's a very, very interesting thesis. I've certainly learnt a lot and um, it's made me think about things that I might not have thought about otherwise. So. I, I have, I don't know, if, is, is there time for uh, one? For a little. Oh, okay. No, the, I just had this one question, which has been sort of nagging me. It's a really simple, probably silly question, but but like, why? I mean, what's the net benefit of of really sort of thinking that the market m may actually have a mind of its own, as opposed to a kind of instrumentalism where you just say, well, look, if you think of it that way, it it you know there are some. You know, it makes sense from the point of view of an investor or something like that. Um, I mean, why? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of. Yeah, so I, I wonder why, why not just be instrument? Why not just forget about all this and leave it to the philosophers and just say, <laughs> well, whatever. You know, whether or not this is crazy that my markets actually have minds, it may be really good from a, the point of view of a of an agent in the market to think of it as though. The market had a mind. So wh what do you gain by going metaphysical that you don't gain by being an instrumentalist, I guess, my question. <laughs>